morning, everyone. Good morning. This is the day God has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Good to see all of you this morning. I pray you had a good week and are doing well. And I also pray that our time together is even more uplifting to you as we worship God together, as we're in fellowship with one another, and as we just have a good day together. I do have quite a few announcements to get through before we get started. Uh, if you could just sign the red welcome folder so that we know that you're here, uh, I would appreciate that. Uh, Easter flour and Easter cookie orders are due today. Uh, so order forms are out on the tables or on the main table by the kitchenette out in the commons area. So if you would like to get cookies for your Easter celebration or flowers in honor or in memory of somebody, please get those to the appropriate persons today. Uh, this Thursday, the Canasta Party and Salad Lunch is happening, and all are welcome uh, to join. Uh, Kathleen is still looking for some help in the kitchen, if possible, right? And uh, so if you can come that day, that would be great. Have some fun, have some salads. Um, just hopefully have a good day on Thursday, too, as well as today. Holy Week is but a week away, and so we got a lot of, lot of things going on. Next Sunday is Palm Sunday, uh, so after service, uh, the mission and service is going to assemble. Well, after, make sure you get your treats. Kathy made sure to get your treats after worship next Sunday, and then after that, go downstairs and assemble Easter baskets. Uh, so if you can help with that, uh, please stay after service and help. On uh, Monday, Thursday, the March 28th, we will have our cantata at 7 p.m. Make sure you come and, and hear that. The choir has been working very hard to, pe to prepare, and you, are, you don't want to miss, miss their hard work. So please come for that. Uh, Friday, March 29th, uh, is Good Friday. We will have the sanctuary open for prayer from 11 to 1 and worship at 7 p.m. Saturday, the 30th, we will have our Hop an Easter adventure at 9.30, with, or with activities starting at 9.30, and then the Easter egg hunt starting at 10 a.m. sharp and ending at 10.01 sharp. <laughs> and then Easter Sunday, March 31st, worship at 9.30, followed by a brunch if you can stay. Um, there are sign-ups uh, to come and to help with providing dishes if possible. Uh, so see that after wor worship if you can. Okay, I think those are all the announcements I have. Are there any other announcements for the good of the fellowship? If there are none, would you please rise as you are able and let us greet one another in the peace and love of our Lord Jesus Christ. And happy St. Patrick's Day to all of you, and good for all of you who wore green. Don't pinch me. I don't, I'll, I'll, I don't know how I'll retaliate, but just don't do it. So, uh, would you let us begin our worship this morning with our choral call to worship, Awesome God, that leads right into our opening song of praise, Lift High the Cross.
Join me with the prayer of confession. Jesus calls us to love our God and our neighbors, but even our best efforts fall short. Yet, God, gracious and merciful, trusting in God abundant mercy, let us confess our sin together and then in silence. Holy God, we confess our love in a way our ability to serve you and others. Our selfishness is spread in our life as you and applied to our community. Forgive us each one a new Christ. Through the Lord, when we pray. Join me with the assurance of pardon. Friends, Jesus reminds us that, that those who serve him will have the assurance of his presence and then trust that you are forgiven, that new life arises, and that Jesus abides with you. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Please be seated. And at this time, I invite any young or young at heart to join me up front. What I want us to do, we're not going to sit on the stairs. If you want to kind of take the front rows, sorry, Vincent's, sorry, Novak's, we're going to kind of possibly take your seats and viewing. Good morning. We're Because we're going to look at the screen. How are all of you this morning? You wanna sit, if you want to sit over here, you're welcome to. All right. So, have, have you ever been to a museum, like an art museum? Yes. Yeah? A lot of times? Well, I know Night at the Museum. You know at Night at, night at the Museum? Movies. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's a pretty, pretty, there's two of them, right? Two movies? Yeah. yeah. I have the first one on DVD. Ever, okay, okay. Yeah. Well, art museums have some beautiful paintings in them, and people come from all over the world to see art, right? So I'm going to see if you know some of the most famous paintings in all the world. All right, so Kathy, if you can change it to the first one, Mona Lisa. That's, this one's a pretty easy one, right? Does everybody see it? But do you know who painted it? Very good, Maddie. Good job. It was Leonardo, Leonardo da Vinci. I almost, in, almost wanted to say Leonardo, Leonardo DiCaprio, but that's not quite right. <laughs> and that's for Disney. Y yeah. He's actually a little, little Einstein. Yes, yeah. No, no, not, we're, we won't worry about DiCaprio today. We'll talk about da Vinci. So how about the next one? Ooh, Vincent Van Gogh. Vincent Van Gogh, yeah, very good. So do you know, does anybody know the, the title of the painting? I know what that title is because they're like, Maddie's got Starry a, Night. Starry Night. Maddie's two for two. Good job, Maddie. You're, you're doing really well. So Starry Night. Starry Night by Vincent Van Gogh. Very good. All right, next painting. Ooh, the Scream. The Scream. Yeah, okay. So I, I had to look this one up. Do you know who painted this one? Uh, what, what was the reason for it? Okay, yep. All right, this one's kind of a hard one. This one is Edward Munch. I believe that's how you pronounce his name. Oh. Did somebody get that? Did you get it? Very good. All right, and that did? Hey, hey. You must know art in your, in your family, huh? 
All right, yeah, all right. All right, last one. This one's a tricky oh, one. Boy, no, <laughs> not quite Picasso. Uh, Mark, uh, let's say Leonardo da Vinci. No, not quite. This one's kind of a trick one. It's, it's, a, it's called, I even had to look it up, Composition 8, very good name, by Kadinsky. So, so, but I don't know. So, do you like this painting? Is it interesting? Do you find I it interesting? It's on TV. You what? It's on TV. It looks like it's on TV. Yeah. yeah. It's a painting. Somebody painted that. Well, so that's what, but, the, but, but the, I guess you could, we're really going to get into it deep this morning. It's like, what is art? Is it, is it just about putting something you see, or is it to make you think? Is it to make you look at the colors and, and think about life, think about what it means? No, that's not what paintings are for. Oh, I don't know. I th not that I'm an art major or anything, but I think that's why people love to look at art, is they come from all over to think and to, to see themselves in the art and what, what, what could, could be reflected of themselves in the art. Well, I hope they don't steal the paintings. That might be another National Treasure movie, Maddie, right? Maybe? I don't know. So people come, people come from all over the world to look at these paintings, to think about them and reflect about them. Well, we come from all over to look at another thing that makes us reflect and ponder and think. Just above the painting, we have the cross. Which is also on the screen. Well, it's kind of on the painting, you're right. That's just because the screen and cross kind of overlap. But whenever we look to the cross, we're to remember, do you remember we just sang a song about it. Do you remember, did you hear what the words are? When we, look, when we look at the cross, we think of the love of God. We think of the love of God that is shown to us in Jesus. In our scripture passage for today, Jesus talks about when he is lifted up on the cross, he will draw all men to him. He will draw all people to him. And like people will come all over the world to look at paintings and think about them and stare at them and, th and, 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 and look at themselves in the painting. Whenever we look at the cross, we can do the exact same thing. We can remember that God loves us, that Jesus came for us. And all people can see that whenever they look at the cross. So whenever you look at the cross, I hope you remember that, that the love of Christ, the love of God, it shows. And that's why we, that's why we have it on, I wear it around my neck, that's why we have it up on, in the sanctuary, is to remind us of God's love for us. All right? So let's pray, and then you could head down to Sunday school. God, thank you that the cross is a wonderful reminder of your love for us in Jesus. Whenever we see it, Wherever it may be, may it remind us of what Jesus has done for us. I pray this in his precious name. Amen. All right, thanks everybody.
Today's scripture reading comes from John chapter 12, verses 20 through 33, which can be found in your pew Bible on page 762. Now there are some Greeks among those who went up to worship with the feast. They came to Philip, who was, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee with request. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. Philip went to tell Andrew. Andrew and Philip in turn told Jesus. Jesus replied, the hour has come from the Son of Man to be glorified. I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. The man who loves 
his life will lose it, while a man who hates his life in the world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. My father will honor the one who serves me. Now my heart is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it and will glorify it again. The crowd was there and heard it and it thundered. Others said an angel had spoken to him. Jesus said, this voice was for your benefit, not mine. Now the, the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of the world will be driven out. But I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. And he said to show the kind of death he was going to die. The word of our God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would you join with me in prayer? May the words of my lips and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So the month of March is an interesting and wonderful turning point in the year. We're beginning to somewhat leave behind the cold and snow of winter and slowly move into the warm and wet of spring. I imagine many of you are beginning your work in your gardens and will soon, if you haven't already, start to plant flowers and vegetables and get to see them grow. Farmers probably aren't quite ready yet to begin planting, but the time will come soon enough when fields across Nebraska will be full of corn and soybeans and wheat and all the other kind of crops that we produce. The seed planted in the ground will soon sprout to become something beautiful to observe or something delicious that can be eaten. The spring season is our yearly reminder of the wonder of new life. I think that's why we often we celebrate Easter. It's a wonderful celebration of resurrection, of new life. But before we can get to talk of new life and resurrection, we first must talk about death. Throughout much of his teaching ministry, Jesus used parables to illustrate or point to the kingdom of God and to help explain complex concepts in more accessible ways, in ways that we can understand. While the Gospel of John is noted as not containing any of Jesus' parables as we usually know them, it's interesting, John kind of does his own thing in his gospel. He, he, doesn't necessarily use, he doesn't use Jesus' parables, but he uses seven signs that point to Jesus' divine identity and mission. But in our text for today, Jesus brilliantly uses the image of a single grain of wheat to teach about his coming passion as well as illustrate what it means to be his follower. Our text begins with an exchange between one of Jesus' disciples, Philip, and some Greeks. The events of this passage, uh, this passage take place during the Feast of Passover, when Jews from around the region and possibly across the known world would come to Jerusalem and observe the High Holy Days. And because they were celebrating Passover, I think it's safe to assume that these, Jewish, these uh, Greeks are Jewish, not Gentiles. And perhaps through 
the grapevine of the ancient world, they have heard about this Jesus of Nazareth. And so they come to one of his disciples, Philip, and they say, Sir, we would like to see Jesus. As we get closer and closer to the crucifixion and the resurrection, this is John's way of inviting his readers into the, into the story. We are like these Greeks. We too want to see Jesus. We want to know what he's about. We want to see him in his fullness and his glory. And so Philip goes to Andrew and then they both go to Jesus and tell him about this request. And Jesus responds by saying in verse 23 that the time has come for all people to see who he really is. And then he gives this metaphor about a single grain of wheat, which to me is interesting, but also kind of goes with how Jesus likes to talk about himself. Throughout John's gospel, Jesus is introduced or declared to be various things, various metaphors. He is the Lamb of God. He is the bread of life. He is the light of the world. He is the door or gate. He is the good shepherd. He is the resurrection and the life. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And he is the true vine. Among all the various choices that Jesus could have used to help the Greeks and us see him, Jesus chooses to describe himself as a single grain of wheat. Now, why? That's the big question. Why would Jesus use this image? Well, I think to better understand why Jesus uses the image of a single grain of wheat, it's good for us to understand how seeds and plants work. And I'm probably preaching to the choir this morning because I know a lot of you already know how seeds work by working in your gardens or working on the farm. And so we, we can understand how in order for a grain or any seed to produce anything, it must first die. It must be sown, buried in a grave of soil and compost, and then die. But once it is there, it is transformed into new life. A single seed planted becomes an entire plant with many stems. It produces many more kernels or berries or fruit. From one thing to a whole new life of many things. Now, on one level, I think this is straight and forward a metaphor about Jesus himself. Through his public ministry, Jesus has already done so much to bring glory and honor to the Father. But he knows that there is even more glorious work to do. And it will require an even greater sacrifice. Jesus knows that he must be like the seed. He must die and be buried in order to produce the fruit of many eternal lives. That's the straight and, and forward reading of this. But on another level, this metaphor is also for us as Jesus' disciples. In verse 26, Jesus says, Where I am, my servant will be also. Now, often this verse is quoted at funerals, and it's to be a comfort, to convey the idea that the deceased person is now in glory with Jesus. And this is certainly true and, and a, good, a good thought, a good message. However, the true purpose of Jesus' words here is a challenge to his followers to recognize themselves as a part of the community that he is planting and cultivating 
and nourishing and developing in order to be of service to the kingdom of God. I find it interesting that the first person mentioned in this text is Philip. Philip is kind of an, is an interesting disciple because he really doesn't get the spotlight very much. Uh, he's usually associated with Peter and Andrew because they share the, the same hometown, but, but usually Peter is the one who gets all the spotlight for better or for worse. But he is the one who is focused on, and Philip and Andrew kind of get pushed to the side a lot of the times. But it's interesting because Philip, when he does get the spotlight, plays some key parts, both in the Gospels and in the early church. For example, Jesus tests Philip when he asks how to feed the 5,000 people gathered back in John chapter 6. During the Last Supper, which will be recorded here in John chapter 14 in a, few ver- in a few chapters, Philip is the one who asks to see the Father, which allows Jesus to assure the disciples that they have indeed seen the Father because they have seen him. In the Acts of the Apostles, it is Philip who encounters the Ethiopian eunuch, proclaims the good news, and then baptizes him on the spot. And according to church tradition, Philip will later be crucified upside down as he is martyred for preaching the gospel. And so Philip is given this opportunity to be a spotlight here because Philip embodies Jesus' metaphor of the grain. He is a representative. He is the one that we get to see who accepted the call to be planted and nourished and then sprout to be of of service to the kingdom of God. And so as I have done in previous weeks, I again invite us to reflect and ponder and think about our discipleship. What does it mean for us to embrace this fall to the ground and die discipleship? Or perhaps another way to phrase it is, what are things or practices of ours, whether personal, maybe as a congregation, what are things or practices that need to die in order for us to then sprout and grow and live and flourish as followers of Jesus. Well, I'll give you my example that I thought of this week. A personal thought of mine that I believe I need to let fall to the ground and die is my assumption of ease in life. By this, I mean that I need to let go of the assumption that everything is going to be easy for me or go the way that I think it needs to go. Because as I reflect back on my 32 years on this earth, I have to admit, you know, I've I've had it pretty good for my life. I didn't have any problems in my education. I got things pretty quickly. I didn't have to struggle. Uh, I've been able to get and hold the jobs that I've had without much stress or problems. I haven't really had to struggle that much financially. I've had a pretty stable life. And so because of that stability, uh, I will admit I sometimes have a tendency to maybe get frustrated when something doesn't quite go the way I want it to, or it doesn't quite come as easy to me as I think it should. And this week I was reminded that I must remember that Jesus never promised me or any of his disciples that they were going to have an easy life. 
I need to remind myself that my life should be used for Jesus' glory, not my own. Not for my own ease, not for my own comfort, but for his. That's what I need to let die. Jesus did not come into the world to be a single grain. Even though he says that his heart is troubled, he declares that he has come for this moment that will soon present itself to him. That he has come to die so that we may live. His purpose does not end at being a single grain. A single grain has not fulfilled its purpose. A single grain may be comforted within its single shell. And perhaps you're like me, where you may often enjoy the comfort and the familiarity and ease of our lives. But a single grain that does not complete its proper life cycle, that is stored away, that is preserved, well, it eventually dies too. But it withers and becomes nothing. Self-protection does not prevent death. It only stops one from fulfilling their life's meaning and purpose. As we are only a week away from once again journeying with Jesus to the cross, I encourage us to take Jesus' words seriously about being a single grain. I think we can tend to try to preserve ourselves. Try to save ourselves from sacrificing. But that only leads to an unfulfilled death. Leads to us withering away and accomplishing nothing. But if we allow the single seed to be buried, to die, and then be regenerated with living water. By God's blessing, it then grows into flourishing and abundant life. And so today, I encourage us to say no, that's our our theme for this Lent, to say no to being a single grain. to being a disciple that dies in order that we may live. Let us pray. Almighty God, as we contemplate the words of Jesus in our text for this morning, we ask that you transform us more and more into the likeness of your Son so that you might use us to bear much fruit in the world. May we die to that which holds us back so that we might live to your glory. Perhaps that means helping us die to anger so that we might live to compassion. Perhaps that means helping us to die to division so that we might live to reconciliation. Perhaps that means to help us die to addictions, so that we might live to well-being. Whatever it may be, may we not remain single grains, but be like Jesus and live sacrificially. Oh God, as we talk about sacrifice this morning, we pray for the leaders of our nation, of our state, and of our community. We pray that they may work with humility, setting aside the greed for power and personal gain. 
We pray that they may continue to work for the betterment of all people. O oh God, we remember all who have been generous to us, all who have shared their resources and their lives. We especially pray for parents who have sacrificed for their children, giving their time and attention and energy. We pray for those who have been denied love, for all who have been deprived of well-being. We especially remember children who are taken into care because of their parents being caught in addiction or trauma or unable to care for them. God, as we remember your gift of redemption through the work of your son, we pray for all troubled souls, those who may be anxious about their health, about their future. And we remember all those who are being persecuted for their beliefs or their principles. We pray for all who are suffering at this time. God, we also pray the prayers of our hearts, the prayers that we can't say aloud, the prayers we don't have words for, the prayers that only you can hear. God, we pray all these things in the name of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. As we remember what God has done for us, what we give back to the work of Christ's church. And as you are able, would you please rise and let us sing together the doxology. Let us join together in our prayer of dedication. O oh God, God, we lay down before you the abundance you have given us and allow it to fall so that you may multiply it to give life to your world. May it be so in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us join together in our hymn, Be Thou My Vision.
May we go forth and may God be our guide and wisdom and vision, leading us to be disciples of Christ in all that we do, living sacrificially, dying so that we may live. And as you do so, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Go in peace. Amen.